our next session is uh, being moderated by my dear friend, Emiliana Simon Thomas, who was for a period uh, the associate director at CCARE. Uh, that SOB, Dacker Keltner, stole her back from me. I'm never going to forgive him. Um, actually, uh, uh, she actually went with my permission. And, uh, but uh, she's a, a wonderful dear. And she's now working with Dacker over at the Greater Good Science Center. She is moderating our next panel. Not only a wonderful human being, but a, a very special, sweet person. And uh, our next uh, panel is on uh, biology and the uh, neuroscience, advances in biology and the neuroscience of compassion. So without further ado, our panelists. Uh, thank you so much, Jim, for that wonderful and heartfelt introduction. Um, I'd like to say that uh, we're absolutely lucky to be here. Um, the experts on this panel are truly at the cutting edge. Uh, their work uh, alone has brought these sort of formerly soft concepts like empathy and compassion and altruism and heroism, perhaps, uh, into the spotlight of serious neuroscience. They're all publishing in top-tier academic journals and uh, bringing this kind of work into the forefront and making it into a, a real cultural meme uh, that is backed by, by rigorous empirical work. Um, whenever I speak or teach in the world about compassion or happiness, I describe as well as I can their pioneering and groundbreaking work. So um, it's an absolute privilege for me to be here and to introduce these four distinguished scientists and um, to give them more time than me because they have more interesting and important things to say. <laughs> I'd like to start by uh, inviting Stephanie Brown to give her presentation. Thank you very much. So like Dr. Zimbardo, I'm very interested in the act of helping behavior, the action. And um, so let's talk about what motivates us to help others. Now, as we've learned in this um, conference, there are many ways to address this question. I'll highlight the fact that in addition to personalities and social norms and emotions, we can also talk about, and hormones, we can also talk about neural circuits. And we've developed a model that integrates these different levels of analysis. And before I um, tell you how we've integrated these different ways of addressing the question of how do we help others, I'd like to show you where we're going with this model. Just to give you a way to orient what I'm going to be saying. And this model, what's, what's important about this model is it suggests that there's two different routes to helping behavior. One through an intrinsic motivation, which is where I might um, think that heroism would fall into play. Um, and another route is through extrinsic motivation. We can feel obligated or coerced into helping someone else. And what determines which of these routes we go would be situational variables, um, interpersonal relationship variables, and individual difference variables. So let's talk about the neuroendocrine features of this model first. I want to draw your attention to the caregiving motivation itself, this what we might call compassionate motivation, the medial preoptic area of the hypothalamus. And again, this not, need not be compassionate motivation per se. It could be vigilance or protection or heroism. Um, the medial preoptic area of the hypothalamus is important because it has been um, discovered in animal research as a dedicated biological, neurobiological system for motivating helping, active helping behaviors, so action, motor programs. And the significance of oxytocin in these models is that oxytocin primes this area of the hypothalamus. It increases the chance that this particular intrinsic um, route to helping behavior will, will win out and lead to helping. And I forgot to mention that another part of that model is also um, Stephen Porter's work on vagal tone and um, 
and this sense of safety and, um, and, and parasympathetic regulation that enables the proper hormones to actually cause the hypothalamus to lead to these active helping behaviors. So let's get to the development of the model. And I'm going to show you concepts, the concepts behind this model. The um, neural circuits I'm not going to describe, but they'll be on the slides for those of you who are interested. But what I'd like to say is this model was developed from an evolutionary perspective, thinking about what should a motivational system for helping behavior look like? What would it need to do from an evolutionary perspective to direct help in ways that are adaptive as opposed to lead to exploitation or taken advantage of? So for the first function is that the system needs to respond to need or distress in others. The second function is that the system needs to be able to help us navigate motivational conflict between helping ourselves and helping others. It can do this in two ways. One is by suppressing avoidance motivation. And really, I think what we're talking about is, is, is embodying the essence of this picture. And it, it also needs to help us suppress our hedonic motivation which it looks at least like this woman is attempting to do. Um, I'm not going to describe this circuit, but it's really fascinating, fascinating. Now, another thing that the system should do is it should be contingent on the avail availability of resources. If we're going to help someone, we, we have to have resources to help with, something to give away. And we can think about the need for mechanisms that are designed to sense when we do not have enough resources, when we feel helpless or depressed. And finally, the last function from an evolutionary perspective is that the system should be able to manage our um, threats to expo exploitation of our helping activities in such a way that it only gets turned on when we're pretty sure we're not going to be exploited. So when trust is high, we're actually going to activate and recruit the hypothalamus as in that intrinsic pathway to helping behavior. And this is accomplished through um, oxytocin priming and binding in these circuits. But when trust is low, we should stay far away from this system. When the chance of exploitation is very high, we should direct activation differently so as to avoid engaging in this sort of selfless uh, willingness to sacrifice or be a hero. So these concepts together um, are now integrated with what we know in social psychology, social psychological concepts, where we can think about the relationship variables and the situational variables as helping us recognize at times that it's safe to help others, safe to engage our hypothalamus, our dedicated biological system. And we can think about individual difference variables like our attachment security, our sense of safety, um, our perceived self-efficacy as necessary to also help us engage this system when we see another's need. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is one of the most critical features of this model. And it's easy to miss because we don't think about, we think about helping and how it makes us feel good or happy or the helper is high, it's rewarding and that's why we want to go help again. Or we regulate our stress when we help. This model isn't saying that. This model is saying something very different. This model is saying you actually do not get to the action of helping behavior. And again, this comes from the neural circuitry. You do not get there unless you have first regulated stress. What that means is that when we think about what is the role of stress in um, disease, we can think about prolonged activation of the stress response as something that is dangerous for the body. So if we've got a system here that's going to interrupt prolonged activation of the stress response, then it may be very beneficial for physical health. And again, this, when we see the helping behavior, we know that stress has actually been regulated first, which allows us to make some predictions and to test the model in, in some very broad ways, which I'm going to show you next. 
So first of all, so the beginning tests of the model are actually um, part of the motivation for developing the model. Um, it's actually, these are evidence, this is evidence, not test. Um, helping behavior, when it's studied in social support, in volunteering, in um, caregiving research, is almost universally associated with a reduced risk of mortality. So when people report helping others, they live longer than the people who report that they haven't helped anyone. Now, given that we see these associations everywhere, we should be able to predict based on this model when helping behavior will be most likely to be related to a reduced risk of mortality. When is it going to be involving that stress regulation? So we expect that helping behavior uh, is predicting longevity when people are encountering a lot of stress or when people have other focus motives for helping as opposed to self-focused mot motives for helping. And that's exactly what we've found. When we've tested this idea, we find that exposure to stressful life events, that's the bar in red, predicts mortality risk strongly, significantly, for individuals who have not helped anyone in the last year. But for those who've helped somebody in the last year, stress is almost unrelated to their mortality risk. Another study we have, we compared reasons for volunteering. Among individuals who had self-focused reasons for volunteering, like protecting themselves or enhancing themselves or even learning or understanding for themselves, we have um, a stronger mortality risk than individuals who are volunteering for altruistic reasons or for social connection. So the motives for volunteering matter in terms of predicting reduced mortality risk. Now, in the last few minutes of my talk, I'd like to tell you about some work we're doing to test the more specific biological um, aspects of the model. And we're really looking at the idea that the closeness of the relationship makes a difference. Close relationship or feelings of closeness increases the chance that people will use this oxytocin-mediated route to, um, that releases progesterone, which is a stress-regulating hormone, um, and that we'll find that when we do not have closeness, you're not going to get that same activation of that, that dedicated biological system. And I'll show you how we looked at that. So first of all, to clarify the predictions, if you help someone you feel close to, you should get a coupling of oxytocin and progesterone um, as a marker of stress regulation. You should get a beneficial association of oxytocin and stress. The literature actually shows that oxytocin doesn't just have all these wonderful stress regulating properties, it's actually also a stress hormone in that it mediates the effect of the stress response. It actually increases blood pressure, increases cortisol, and mediates the effect of substance P on ACTH. So we know that oxytocin in the literature is doing really good things for stress and really bad things for stress, but we don't yet know why or when or how. So we should expect, if there are people are in the system, oxytocin is going to be beneficial for stress. And then given the role or the relationship between stress and the immune system, we're also expecting that um, markers of immune activation will go down when people are engaged in this um, caregiving system. So how do we manipulate the caregiving system? We randomly assign young adult females um, to participate in a study of social motivation. And we ask them to go through um, a closeness induction which is a very simple 15-minute get to know your partner by revealing intimate personal things about yourself, and you take turns. And when people go through this um, closest induction, it's, it's been shown to lead to relationships, uh, the development of relationships in laboratory studies. We put people through this situation, or we don't. So we assign them to be close or not. They either help someone they've gotten close to, or they help a stranger, or they do the exact same thing to help themselves. And this is working on a reaction time task to benefit your partner. Say so your partner is going to get to avoid an aversive consequence if you do well enough on this task. Okay, so that's how we're looking at helping. And then we expose everyone to a stress induction where we tell them there's a task for you too and you know what, we're going to make you have to give a public speech if you don't do well enough on the task. And then at the end we tell them, oh, guess what, you did well enough to avoid this, this speech and so then we look to see how long it takes them to recover from stress. So that's the basic um, paradigm. And these are our results for oxytocin. When individuals help a partner that they feel close to, again, people who went through a closeness induction with their partner, oxytocin 
predicted a significant decrease in their systolic blood pressure. We have a lot of other findings. I'm just highlighting some of the most obvious illustrative ones. When individuals help a stranger, we do not see a decrease in blood pressure when, they're in under, when they go through the stress activation. And when they help themselves, you can see here that oxytocin is actually predicting an increase in blood pressure. And you can see there's no association between oxytocin and cortisol for individuals who helped a close partner in this caregiving system. But when individuals help a stranger, their cortisol actually goes up as a function of higher levels of oxytocin. Again, making sense of these contradictory effects of oxytocin in the literature. And then progesterone was probably our most um, interesting finding because traditionally oxytocin and progesterone are thought to antagonize one another that um, oxytocin suppresses progesterone. Well, it turns out at very low doses, oxytocin actually increases progesterone. We found the coupling of oxytocin and progesterone that we expected when individuals help a close partner and no association of oxytocin and progesterone in the other two conditions. And then the inflammatory cytokines um, did exactly what we expected. Only when individuals helped a close partner do we see a drop in both the, um, the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory um, markers of cytokine activity. So I'd like to conclude by just talking about a few implications. Um, if this model continues to be supported, it should be able to be able to use to develop some behavioral interventions for individuals with stress-related or inflammatory disease. Um, it also encourages the development of staff-patient relationships as a vehicle for helping staff in organizational settings who are not necessarily feeling very close to the patients that they're helping. Um, it also raises the possibility that there's something about the interaction of oxytocin and progesterone that could be a suitable target for pharmacological intervention. And I say this because not only do we find these mortality benefits, but progesterone is wildly beneficial when it comes to regulating physiological homeostasis. So although oxytocin is um, uh, mixed in terms of its role in um, the immune system, uh, progesterone has the ability to turn on the immune system in ways that are beneficial for the body while blocking some of the harmful effects of turning on the immune system. And the broader implications is that this model is consistent with what I think we're all talking about here, which is that there is another motivational system beyond fight or flight and beyond um, uh, hedonic pursuits. And on a societal level, this work suggests um, that we might be able to shape cultural forces that kind of turn off our caregiving system by thinking about how important messages of safety and trust um, in our fellow neighbors and human beings are to allow our natural helping pulses to come out. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you so much. Um, when I uh, became a parent myself, um, I, this is what really catapulted me into this space of studying compassion and caregiving and, and, and empathy and loving kindness and common humanity. And it wasn't until I came across Stephanie's work that it all sort of came together. I was like, okay, <laughs> this is very personally validating. Uh, if you haven't uh, come across or had a chance to look at Stephanie's edited book, um, Moving Beyond Self-Interest, it's an incredible resource and lays out her model um, very elegantly. And um, for us scientists, it's a very important foundation for figuring out how to actually study and grapple with these, these ideas that sometimes are, feel less tangible. So our next speaker, uh, Brian Knudsen, also a professor at Stanford, um, you guys can read his bio. Um, what I'd like to say about him personally is that I've known him for, gosh, longer than I really want to count. But uh, long ago, I came and gave a presentation about my electrophysiology findings in grad school. And uh, Brian was one of the first academic professors who was just authentically completely kind, interested, yet discerning and constructive in his dynamic and, and interaction with me. And I've always sort of looked up to him for having that sort of trait as, a, as an academic. So uh, again, welcome, Brian, and thank you for telling us what you're about to tell us.
Good morning. Um, I'm very excited to be here uh, for a number of reasons. One thing I wanted to point out at the beginning of this presentation is that not so long ago, the science of compassion was considered an oxymoron. So if you don't take anything else away from this session, I hope you uh, realize that progress is occurring slowly, but it's occurring. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to note at, at the outset is this is the work of Alex Janewski, who's sitting in the back of uh, the room, and he will be presenting a poster today, and he will be on the job market next year. I'm just saying. <laughs> so if you like it, talk to him. Um, okay. So. We, We've all been, and I'm, I feel very fortunate to go after Jamil because you're going to see some synergy here in our presentations. Um, this is a question that we've been discussing for the last day and a half, why give to others? And um, it's interesting because the people in this room probably assume, assume certain causes. And if I were to go to an economics department, they would assume different causes. Uh, and so I think rather than saying, you know, one side is right or the other side is right, it's, it's worthwhile to consider all of the options and then try to really figure out what's driving giving to others. And notice I'm not talking about compassion here, I'm really talking about giving to others as Stephanie did. Uh, and then sort of trying to work backwards into the components of what drives that behavior. So for instance, people have talked about relatedness and you saw that in Jamil's data. Um, when others get rewards and, and they're related to us, you know, we actually have a kind of a physiological response to that uh, that is significant and influences our well-being. Uh, other reasons might be reciprocation, like I might give to you because uh, we're in a business relationship and I think you're going to give back to me. And that also could be self-interested, and, and Dan Batson has laid all of this out beautifully. Uh, another is reputation. I might know that others are watching me, and I want uh, um, them to have a good uh, a sense of the kind of person that I am, so maybe they'll give to me later. So I'm giving out of uh, reputational concerns. And again, that's sort of self-interested. But the fact of the matter is, not all the time, but some of the time, we give to strangers, people whom we may never know or meet. Uh, and in fact, this is possibly more common than we all might realize. And there are actually mechanisms now on the internet and in other places that take advantage of this kind of behavior uh, in, in really novel and innovative ways. And that's where I hope to end. Uh, I have some novel data today to share with you about that. So for instance, uh, sometimes when somebody's in dire need, there'll be an outpouring of support. And I'm not just talking about you know, smiling or something like that, I'm talking about economic support. So this is a classic example of baby Jessica a long time ago who fell down a well in Texas and was on the TV and all, people sent tons of money to her so that she now has a good college trust fund. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we're uh, confronted daily with um, examples of people in need and, and we often give nothing to those people uh, for various reasons. And so it's a, what I'd like to point out is that the same person could have both responses. The same person could be very generous in some circumstances and not in others. And so that suggests that something, if it's not random, something must be going on to drive that behavior, both externally and in your brain and psychologically. Um, so if I have time, um, I'll, I'll just cover a little bit of background. Uh, fortunately, Jamil has covered some of this background. Um, then I'll describe a couple of experiments on giving and on lending, which also we have evidence is, is looking like it could be a charitable behavior, even though most people don't think of it that way. And then briefly to touch on some implications. So as a psychologist, when I think about um, giving, and there's a lot of great research out there on this, um, there are many possible mechanisms that could drive giving. Uh, and I'm, when I say giving here, I'm talking about giving money to someone else. Um, one could be social rules. That's just the way it's done in this culture. Another could be you're paying attention for some reason to that person. Another could be that you're taking their perspective. These are all fairly high level um, types of psychological phenomena that humans but not other animals will show. Another could be um, that you feel a certain way that something about that appeal has caused you to feel a certain way, and there are many different feelings, and you've already heard about how many feelings can drive behavior from Paul Gilbert. But I'd like to just point out uh, a couple of feeling states uh, that we think are important because they happen before you do something. So they don't just happen in reaction to something that has occurred in the environment, but they happen as you're anticipating doing something, and therefore are situated in time in a way that they could influence your next behavior. So one set of emotions might be negative and arousing, and this could include guilt, maybe some types of empathy. Another type, uh, and this is what something Jamil f focused on, another type of affect could be positive and arousing. So you could feel excited, not just about the fact that you're going to give somebody something, but just excited about in anticipation of giving them something. So um, this has been described both by psychologists and economists. 
And so this is just a graphical depiction of the two types of feelings I'm talking about, and I won't go into how uh, we talk about these psychometrically, but um, they're easy to measure and self-report in people. So the positive arousal we think is adaptive because it promotes approach behavior, whereas the negative arousal is also adaptive because it promotes avoidance behavior. But in the case of giving, each of these could plausibly drive giving to other people. Um, we have neural targets uh, where we think we can look in the brain as people are contemplating choices uh, that we think uh, the activity in these areas is associated with these feeling states. So without going into too many details, um, one of those areas that Jamil discussed, the nucleus accumbens in orange here, um, we think um, is uh, the activity that we observed with fMRIs correlated with a positive aroused state, uh, feelings of excitement. And, um, Activity in other areas we think is more associated either with just feeling aroused or even feeling negative arousal. Uh, and I won't go into the, the research on that, but you'll have to trust me that there is quite a bit of it now, uh, even though there's still some um, disputes about that. One thing I want to point out in terms of progress, aside from the science of compassion comment, is that we're entering a phase of neuroimaging where we, we don't just ask about correlations. So we don't just send things into the brain and say what's correlated with that. That's very exciting but we can also now start to predict behavior. That means that we have the temporal and spatial resolution to ask what happened in the brain before they decided to do that, before they chose that, before they trusted that person. And that's actually a related but separate set of questions because you can imagine that I might see somebody and have a lot of, whoops, I didn't mean to do that, I will go back, and have a lot of reactions here on the, on the left side in my brain with correlated activity, but only some of those neural responses will actually drive my behavior, my subsequent behavior towards that person. And so this is a kind of a subtle point, but it's a very exciting point, and uh, I'll try to elaborate on that uh, through the rest of the presentation. Okay, so let's talk about some data. Let's talk about how this might cash out, so to speak. Um, one interesting effect that was mentioned yesterday is the identifiable victim effect. I think Daryl Cameron mentioned it. Um, and this is this interesting tendency for people to give more to salient, concrete, single people than to either unidentified people or groups of people. And it's a really interesting effect from a psychological perspective because a lot of these mechanisms have been suggested to account for it. Uh, so we thought we would try to investigate this using both behavioral and neuroimaging experiments. And I'm going to just describe the neuroimaging experiment today. And what we tried to manipulate was um, the vividness of a recipient, a potential recipient of a charitable gift uh, from our subjects. And so we, we wanted to look at these target regions at their activity before people decided, am I going to basically make a charitable donate, donation to this orphan or not, and see if we could predict whether they were going to be more likely to do that or not. So uh, in the neuroimaging experiment that I'll describe, uh, this is, these are just details of the experiment uh, that if you do neuroimaging you would be interested in, but it, it may be a little bit um, too uh, low level for this talk. But the basic idea is we gave people money and we said, you're going to go in and decide on 60 orphans. Some of those orphans we have pictures for, some we don't have pictures for. Uh, we're going to ask you to give a range of, 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 of your money. We're going to pick one trial for real at the end of the experiment, and whatever you decide on that tri trial counts. Uh, we'll deduct the money from your endowment, and we'll send it to the orphanage. So this is how the stimuli looked. Um, we, here on the left, you see that you, there's a child. These are actually real kids at orphanages, although we weren't able to get the money directly to those kids, but we did send them to the orphanage. So that's incentive compatibility and economic speak. Um, so here's a child where we have the picture, and here's a child on the right with a sort of a Facebook type silhouette uh, where we don't have the image. And what's interesting about these stimuli is that even within the same person, they will elicit a different level of giving, amazingly. Um, so for instance, if you were in my magnet, you might see a fixation point, and then you would see this, this kid who could be a recipient of your donation. Then you would see a request for an amount of your donation, $5 out of $15. And then you would be able to indicate, yes, I want to give that much, or no, I don't want to give that much to that kid. And you have to do this for, um, I think it was 60 trials. And then at the end, um, uh, uh, you go on to the next trial. So if you were my magnet, you would see this, this, and this, you would respond. It's interesting to think how you would respond on that particular trial, probably. Um, but at any rate, what, what I'm going to show you is brain activity that occurs when people are presented with photos versus silhouettes. And then I'm going to show you how that brain activity relates to the decision 
to cho choose to say, yes, I want to donate or not in our subject. So on the left here, uh, we have basically plots of activity in three brain areas that we think might be interesting. The nucleus accumbens, which you heard about before, the anterior insula, which might be a, more associated with sort of a negative arousal, and the amygdala, which has also been associated with not only face perception, but arousal. And what you see is in all these three areas, at different points in time, um, I don't have a pointer, but on the top area, you see a peak in activity uh, in response to the face versus the silhouette, right before people make a decision. In the anterior insula, that peak is a little earlier, and in the amygdala, it's even earlier still, right when the face comes on the, on the screen. And you might think, oh, that's cool. These areas are involved in giving, but not so fast. Because if you look at what's going on in these areas, right before people are about to give, uh, what you see now is a steady ramp up in nucleus accumbens activity w when you're fated to give to that child versus not. So before you make the decision, uh, but not in anterior insula activity and not in amygdala activity. So this is really e interesting. This suggests there might, we might have isolated a substrate that can mediate the input and convert that to output. And in fact, we did a mediation mediation model. I won't go into the complexity of that. And we're able to show that on a trial-to-trial -trial basis, nucleic cummins activity could mediate the relationship between having seen a photograph or not and the decision to give to the child or not. Uh, especially on these trials with the photographs. So uh, I, won't, I won't try to describe everything on that chart. Now this is actually economically significant even within subject. The value of having a photograph means that people will give on average 50% more on that trial than they would on other trials. So it's hard to argue that, that these photographs are, are just sort of a marketing trick or they're not economically significant, at least on an individual level. What we've also looked at, that's just a mediation graph, um, what we've also looked at is lending, and uh, Alex um, had the great idea to uh, not only to look at lending in our typical laboratory circumstance, and I'll show you data on that, but also to go to the internet um, and to specifically go to an organization called Kiva.org. How many people have heard of Kiva.org? Almost everybody in this crowd. This is remarkable to me. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard of it, it is a micro-lending website. You can go online, you can read profiles, you can decide whether you want to lend $25 to that person or a certain amount, uh, and um, eventually your loan gets repaid, and then you can do the whole process again, or you can take your money out. That's how Kiva works. Um, and one great thing about Kiva, other than the service they're providing, is they have an API that allows you to extract their data. So you can extract their lending web pages, you can look at the funding rates, you can look at the funding success of the requests, and we could try, Alex really, could try to deconstruct what are the features of these request pages that are really driving the decision to loan. And so that's what he did uh, with 13,500 loan requests. So I don't know if this is big data or not, but to me this is very large data. Um, uh, it's a lot, you know. So, and what, what's really cool about um, this type of an analysis is you can actually, as part of it, you can automate. So you can say, okay, here's some text about this woman. And we can take that text and farm it and bin it into positive and negative categories. And we can, and so he did that. Uh, so uh, happy is like a positive word. These aren't quite lined up, but help is a positive word, support is a positive word, and so forth. Uh, the face is a little more difficult. Now remember from the previous experiment, we think that the face might really matter, right? And so what we wanted to do is um, code those faces. And so what, what he did was send them to MTurk and have people rate Ah, here's the linguistic coding, so you can see that some of those words are coded as positive, some are negative, that's the easy part. The face, he actually sent these kinds of forms to MTurk. So he scraped off the photographs, we asked people on MTurk, how positive is this person, how aroused, how negative, and then some emotion, emotion categories too, what emotion is this person expressing. So we could take all of that and put it in a regression model with other variables that you might care about, I won't go into, and ask, you know, what is driving loan? acceptance and loan rate. And basically the same factors are driving both. So here's the answer. Um, sure enough, consistent with our previous experiment on giving, this is on lending, not giving, okay? And if you're an economist, you might say lending is different because lending is not a charitable act. Well, it turns out it kind of is in Kiva because you're not getting interest and there's an opportunity cost. Uh, but needless to say, the same kind of mechanisms seem to be at work. So. If you have a positive photo, a po photo that's judged as positive by people on MTurk, that is, is, uh, promotes uh, loan acceptance and also the rate of funding. 
Um, and you can see that sort of in a linear way too over here. The ratings of positive arousal, arousal linearly vary with the aggregate funding rate of that loan. That means how fast it got to the, its funding acceptance. Um, you can look at categorical emotions too. Uh, which I was hoping Paul would be here so he would see this, but Emiliana will appreciate it. So you can look at sort of, you know, what expression does that person seem to have? And this seems to pan out even there, much to our surprise, by the way, because we thought sad expressions would also boost loan rates. And sad expressions do okay, uh, but there's, uh, the happy expressions really win in this kind of a competition. Okay, so that's really interesting, but we haven't e actually shown in this case that the, that people's affective reaction actually drives this willingness to loan. That's one thing we haven't shown, because we've got separate people rating the photos and, and giving to the photos, right? We also haven't shown that what we found in the lab really scales to the aggregate, that that kind of a mechanism. So this summer, Alex did a second uh, study, what I'll call a neural focus group study. The idea here is we get people in the magnet to do the same thing that people are doing online and we look at their behavior, and then we also look at other variables, like their brain activity and their affective reactions, and I'm out of time, but um, I will just show you this data. And 28 people, and what we find is the following. Um, when they do this exercise in the magnet, what we find is that their rated positive arousal for the loan request mediates the association between their choices and the aggregate funding rate. So you can basically use this fo focus group activity to predict aggregate funding outcomes, and in fact, brain activity also does it better than the actual choices of the focus group. So in that nucleus accumbens area we were talking about. And here's the regression model, just comparing different effects. And this is cool because you can compare different accounts. And what you see here is that yes, their choices on aggregate will predict aggregate funding rates, uh, but so does their positive or post hoc positive arousal ratings of those photos. If you put everything together, and so does, by the way, activity in the nucleus accumbens, and if you put everything together, the only survivors left standing are positive arousal and nucleus accumbens activity. So this is very exciting because it suggests that there is some validity to what we're doing in the lab and even in the magnet, and it can tell us something, not only about what's happening at the aggregate level, but what are those mechanisms that are driving the behavior? Okay, so I'm out of time. Uh, but I, I'll just leave you with this summary. Um, photographs can increase giving by inducing positive affect, and the same is true of lending, apparently, at least for micro-lending. Uh, neuropsychology allows us to identify and leverage these components that promote charity, uh, and we think it will help us to actually encourage charitable giving. Uh, and these components seem to be conserved because they're so deep in the brain evolutionarily, uh, but they're flexible, and they extend across levels of analysis. Uh, and there are implications for charities, we think, and lawmakers and humans. Uh, uh, and I will leave you with that. Uh, I want to thank Alex Janowski, our funding uh, agents, including CCARE, who has been very patient with us, uh, and you for being here. Thanks. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Alex. Um, I'm a huge fan. And, and what I'm taking away from Stephanie, Jamil, and Brian's sort of uh, sequential presentations is this growing um, emergence of the importance of tuning in to other people's positive emotions, which uh, is, is a really interesting possibility and, and perhaps motivation to take on since a lot of times we seem to orient more to the possibility of other people's negative emotions. We're concerned about somebody uh, judging us or not liking us or not thinking we're good enough or we have lots of insecurity. And, and here we're beginning to sort of build this, this, this evidence that, that in fact really tuning into others' positive emotions and, and allowing our own positive emotions that are intrinsic to the presence of other people to occur more readily is something that's, that's been beneficial. And, so, so now the question is, um, how do we kind of in, in, how, how do we create this, con this 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 scaffolding culturally, right? And, and Stephanie brought this up. Are there ways that we can make uh, our, our general ideas about about what we what what drives us and what what makes us well um, uh, in, into in, into our, our our general way of thinking? And one of the ways to do that is to is to try to get in touch with kids and, and, and look into education, the sphere of, of, of thinking as it's emerging. And instead of emphasizing the independent and competitive and self-esteem and, you know, I have to always be the most successful in my group attitude, we can work more um, 
towards um, building these values into uh, education. And, and that is what I hope my good friend Mary Helen is going to tell us about since she sort of uh, straddles the space of the science and education in a way that um, I'm always impressed by. So thanks, Mary Helen. Um. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak here today. It's, it's kind of intimidating, I have to say, to speak after the three speakers that just went. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. So <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just launch right in. So um, I actually do work centrally in the field of education. That's my, my home discipline. I think that it's just an extraordinarily important problem to be able to bring this science into the way in which we raise and educate our children um, so that they can become socially responsible, compassionate, and sophisticated uh, decision makers and adults. Um, but what I'm actually going to talk about today is my neurobiological work on uh, the feeling of compassion, um, the way in which we come to have a conscious experience of the embodied reactions that our other panelists have talked about. So we've heard a lot about how our brain is actually there to control and regulate our body through stress physiology, through hormonal regulation, through any number of complex processes that are ultimately there to preserve homeostasis, to make us live fluently and efficiently and comfortably in a physical uh, body. But what we're also finding and what we've heard about is that our social mind is in effect layered into or co-opting and reorganizing, reusing the very same neural systems whose job it is to keep us alive and functioning well so that our biological selves and our social cultural selves are totally intertwined from a biological perspective and codependent on one another such that our social behavior is shaping our biological well-being and the other way around. And what I'm asking in today's talk is how is it that we come to have conscious experiences of compassion. So there's all these things going on below the level of your conscious awareness, and some of them are presumably being uh, sort of bubbling up into a conscious space in which we can become aware of the emotion we're having, the sort of empathic resonance that we share with another human being who's maybe in need or who's maybe experiencing something positive, and we have this kind of resonance with that person. How do we become aware of that? And what are the implications of that uh, uh, conscious awareness for the way in which we understand neurobiologically and culturally what compassion is? So I'm going to start the talk with uh, this uh, painting, which looks much more stark in the projection system than it does in real life. It's a painting done by a friend of mine, Margaret Lazari, who's the chair of the fine arts department at the University of Southern California. And what Margaret did is she came into our lab and let us take pictures of her brain. And then we sort of took those pictures and we stripped off all the cortex around the outside, all the little cells that do the firing, right? We stripped them off the picture, not off the lady, right? Um, and then uh, we took, you know, you just got to say it, you never know what people think. Uh, and then we took all the, the, what we call white matter, the, the billions of tiny little saltwater tubes, right, that allow these, uh, these cells to communicate with one another and to form complex networks that allow you to actually be a whole person functioning in the world. Uh, and we, she painted those uh, white matter from her own brain into a beautiful, huge, vibrant seascape of life. So she's got these white squiggles in the middle, which are meant to look like clouds or waves or something, but in actuality are her brain. And she's got it floating in this seascape of life with these little weeds growing up through the bottom. And the whole thing is kind of sloshing back and forth in, in, uh, in an ocean that's bolstering it up. And she's got little red fish swimming by to represent the spontaneity of our creative ideas and the sun shining down to warm it. And that's the way that I like to think about the brain as a culturally embedded, socially bolstered organ. So it's a biological thing, but it's also at once a social and cultural thing, quite literally. And, oops, uh, I don't want this to play yet. Thank you. Uh, so next, I thought I would just show you a video of an, of an experiment participant in my lab who is arguably experiencing compassion to a true social story that we shared. One of our social stimuli that we use in the lab to induce compassion, we also induce emotions like admiration for virtue um, and other kinds of admiration and compassion. Um, 
And I just wanted us to, to watch this video, which lasts about a minute, in which he's answering the question, how does this person's story make you feel? And this is the question that we ask during this two-hour interview where a person sits alone with me or with my postdoc or one of my students, and we tell them a series of true stories about real people's lives. We show them the real person in video as much as we could get about that person's life, almost like mini documentaries. And this young man is reacting to a story about another young man in China who was born during a period of economic recession. Uh, and when he was uh, just a newborn infant, his father passed away. So it was just his mom who raised him. And when he was two years old, his mother lost her job as a professional uh, and ended up, because of an economic recession, and she ended up having to take on two jobs as a laborer to be able to support him. Uh, and she went through their lives, sometimes not even with enough money to be able to feed them uh, properly. And uh, it, the little boy always told his mom, you know, someday I'm going to grow up and be an architect and I'm going to support you, mom, and make you a beautiful house and everything. So he grew up all the way to an adult and, uh, and started university. And during his first uh, semester at university, his mom passed away um, because she was still working two jobs as a laborer uh, to support herself. And he continued going to school. And just by chance, he met a young man in one of his classes who was studying to be a documentary filmmaker. And that young man was making a course project film out of the archives from the university library of interviews that had been done by journalism students on the street of people during this recession about the conditions on the street and asking people what their lives were like. And amazingly, he unearthed a video interview with that young man's mother explaining what it was like to raise her son when he was eight years old. They had interviewed her. And of course, she had never told him about this interview. Um, but she, uh, uh, here he was now as a young adult with his mom having passed away, watching what she had to say about it. And she's telling a story about how one day in February, it was sleeting and snowing and freezing cold out and at 3.30 in the afternoon she was walking to get him from school. He was eight years old and as she was crossing the street in the slush in the snow the way she felt knowing that he had not eaten since 6.30 that morning and she had no food for him and she had no money to be able to buy him anything to eat. And as she was going across the street she saw glittering in the snow this little coin and she picked it up and realized it was like 25 cents and she ran off to a street vendor and bought these warm cakes and wraps them up inside her coat and goes and gets him and she describes when he comes out of the school and says, Mom, what's wrong? Do you have a stomach ache? And she says, no, no. And she shows him the cakes. And she describes the look on his face in this interview. And then he begins to eat the cakes. And he stops before the last one. The little boy does. And he says to his mom, but mom, this one is for you. You haven't had any. And she says, no, 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 no. These are the ones I saved for you. I already had mine. And he says, oh, great, because these are the most delicious cakes I've ever had. And he eats the last one. So what you're watching here is a young man react to that story. And all I ask him, you'll hear me say at the beginning of the video, is how does this person's story make you feel? And I just want you to notice, there are many things you could think about in watching this video, but I want you to notice the kind of trajectory of his psychological and, uh, and embodied response, the kind of component pieces that he goes through. And notice that these are also very cultural and they're very individual, but this young man really does an excellent job of, of kind of exteriorizing his experience for us, which is really what the interview protocol is meant uh, to do. Um, this is all that's hit me the most, I suppose. And I'm not very good at like, verbalizing emotions. I, just, I don't know, I think my brain's just not wired that way. But yeah, um, I can almost feel any, like physical sensations. So this one is like, I think there's a, a balloon or something just under my sternum, like, inflating and moving like up and out, but which, I don't know, is like my sign of something really touching. Uh, and so like, like the selflessness, and so like, like the selflessness of the mother, and then also of the little boy, you know, having these like wonderful cakes that he never gets to have. And it's still like offering them to her. Um, and then her turning them down is. Uh, and it makes me think about like, like my parents, because I don't. They provide me with so much, and I don't thank them enough. I don't think. I know I don't. Um, so I should do that. <laughs> 
Why are you laughing? Okay. I have to just make one dumb joke. When you, I showed this once at the Society for Neuroscience to a huge room of neuroscientists, not a single soul left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Take that as you will. But what we basically found, um, and now many other groups have also contributed to these findings, is that feeling compassion or feeling, in fact, any kind of complex social emotion about another person's mind state involves the neural mechanisms that allow you to feel and regulate your own body in the most basic sense and also to construct your own sense of self, your own sense of agency and awareness. And so now we get to the kind of scientific hypothesis that I'm going to talk to you about, which is that if the feeling of compassion is in fact a neurobiological process that's built off of the regulation of your own body, and if the feeling of an emotion is the building of a conscious experience of a bodily set of changes that you then map back neurobiologically and construct into some kind of conscious uh, meaning about the way that you feel about something in, an, in a conscious way so that you can answer a question like, how does this story make you feel? And if we know that emotional ideals for behavior and the ways in which people are expected to express emotion around the world varies, so that some people, and in some cultural groups, it's much more normative to be more expressive, more outgoing, to cry, to gasp, to show your emotion outwardly. Whereas for other groups, it's much more normative and idealized to regulate and uh, sort of suppress expression in favor of a kind of other focusedness. How might that, in essence, shift the internal construction process that a person goes through to build experience? Because if our experience construction process is built out of an embodied set of changes, and if the embodied set of changes is shifted over time by your cultural learning, then it's possible that the way in which we actually experience emotion is related to the cult cultural and social learning that we've been exposed to, and that what appears to be universal on the surface could actually internally be qualitatively different uh, depending on how you naturally behave. So what we're actually asking is, are these differences related to differences in the feeling process? Do they shape the way in which we subjectively experience a complex emotion like compassion? And so just to kind of step back to science mode again, I'll just give you an overview of the experiment protocol. So we start by measuring baseline psychophysiology. I won't talk about that today. Then we move people into an experiment uh, in which they sit for two hours. Either this experiment that I'm talking to you about happened at uh, University of Southern California in Los Angeles and also at Beijing Normal University in Beijing because we were looking for cultural differences, and it's known that uh, in China, normative behavior is much more to be uh, uh, sort of regulated and calm during emotion, as compared to in Los Angeles, where it's more normative to be more expressive and outgoing. Doesn't mean that every person conforms to those ideals, but it means that's the norm, or that's what you strive for. Um, and then we move the person into the scanner, uh, and we're recording psychophysiology and neural activity. At the same time as we're showing them the stories again, and in short snippets and asking them to think about each one while we show them a long gray screen and to uh, tell us how they're feeling in real time. As soon as they're aware of their experience, as soon as they know how they feel, they should push a button to tell us how strongly they're feeling. And then we take them out of the uh, scanner and we ask them again about their experience. And the first thing is that we built a corpus of stories that we piloted extensively in China and in the US um, in uh, university populations. And we piloted them to be equivalent in the two groups. They were half about Chinese protagonists, half about Americans. They're all true stories. Um, and the first thing to notice is that we had no differences in the strength of emotions people were saying they were experiencing to our stories in China and in the US in these university populations. So one means I don't feel very strongly at all right now. Two means I definitely feel something. Three means I'm very strongly emotional right now. Four means I am overwhelmed with emotion right now. And we make very clear what we mean by that and that they don't need to use the whole range of buttons that they should imagine they're in the interview talking to us, what would you say if I asked you how you felt? 
And so now we get into the neural hypotheses, and we're coming back to a part of the brain which you already heard about from Brian, which is the anterior insula. And the anterior insula was our neural uh, region of interest here, in particular because it's thought that the body maps that are the basis for the neurobiological experience of emotional states are have the possibility of coming most fully into conscious awareness in this part of the brain. If you poke in this part of the brain, right, during ne famous neurosurgery experiments back in the 1950s with Wilder Penfield and his colleagues, he found that people vomit, right, or they get other kinds of gastromotoric responses. This is literally visceral somatomotor cortex, and some of the greatest insights over the last 30 years of research in emotion and uh, its neurobiological substrate is that the experience of emotion seems literally to be built out of the same cortex that is controlling the feeling of your guts. It's as if poets have known this for thousands of years, the heart fluttering with love or the stone in the pit of your stomach being expressions of your emotion state, not just of your digestive state. And so, it happens that there are two regions uh, to this uh, sector, and it's very important to know that. Um, the purple region is what we call the dorsal region, and that region is much more somatosensory. It's feeling back what happens in your body. Whereas the aqua region, that's more ventral, is the modulatory, autonomic modulatory region. It's doing much more of trying to regulate the physiological reaction that constitutes the emotion itself. It's more tied to the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and to other regions that you've heard about already. And so what we did was we asked people in China and in the US to tell us in real time how they were feeling. And what we showed is that the amount of neural activation the different groups had to the stimuli was not different at all. It's the same in the entire brain across the groups. And the kinds of feelings people were reporting and the strengths of feelings was not different. But what we found is that the region of the anterior insula that correlated most tightly in real time with the person's experience of emotion differed with culture. And you can sort of see it in this graph. So uh, we have Chinese uh, participants in Beijing with red circles and Ameri American participants, fourth generation American monolingual English speaking representative of the ethnic diversity in the USC campus in blue squares. And we have Asian American USC students, uh, second generation in uh, green triangles. And what you see is that there's a main effect of cultural group on how much people's feelings were correlating with the ventral autonomic modulatory region as compared to with activity in the dorsal somatosensory region. In other words, um, in American groups, on average, people's feelings tracked with the activity in the somatosensory region that feels back your guts, whereas in, on average, in China, people's feelings tracked with the activity in the modulatory region that's sort of regulating the way in which the emotion itself is expressed. So we wanted to ask, I need like one minute, um, if this cultural effect could be related to cultural influences on behavior, whether differences in expressiveness are actually mediating this effect or where this cultural effect comes from. And so we looked at participants' behavior in the interview and we coded it for how expressive it is. And we basically find that in China, people are less expressive than in uh, America. That makes sense. It's been known for a long time. Asian Americans were in between the two other groups and we replicated all of these groups. And so we looked at the effect of expressiveness on, these, uh, on the neural activity. And what we basically found, I'm sorry for the statistics, but if you just bear with me, is that expressiveness across individuals did not predict how strongly people felt. So people could be very calm and say, this is hugely moving to me, right? Which makes sense. It did not predict how much activation you had in the somatosensory region that's feeling your guts. Everyone was activating that region when they felt strongly. But what it does predict in real time is the correlation between those two things. How tightly your feeling experience, your conscious experience is tracking with the activity in the somatosensory region. And we actually find that expressiveness mediates the relationship, the cultural group difference. In other words, it sort of explains why we were finding a cultural group difference and how neural activity corresponds to feelings. So just to wrap up, what we find is that expressiveness, which is influenced by culture, seems to also be influencing the neural processing of experience, which tells us, in effect, 
that we must be learning from our social world how to construct a conscious awareness of our sense of compassion for other people, that we learn this in part by our deals passed on by our cultural settings and in part by our education through our experiences in the social world, we come to have a sense of conscious self that is fitting with the way uh, we um, aim to within a certain group. And it could be that more expressive people, either they're this way naturally because they're reactive or because their culture teaches them that it's okay to be this way, may learn over time that when you have an emotional reaction to another person, if you want to know what that is, how you are feeling at that moment, you might need to attend more to the sense of your body because you're, there's sort of more information there. If your body is reacting in a bigger magnitude way, then there might be more information there to know how you feel as compared to if you're from a culture where you're learning to suppress and regulate and modulate your emotion so that you can decide how you feel in a different way, then you're not, uh, then, then the, the role of your body in that experience is different. What that tells us is that we are learning how to construct experience based on the way we habitually behave within cultural contexts. Okay, thank you. It's always something of an unfair proposition to ask super smart academic intellectuals to talk for 15 minutes. Um, we were supposed to have uh, a little bit longer for questions, um, but we have a little bit shorter. So if you have a burning question, um, please stand up and ask it quickly, and um, we'll get through as much as we can. And then uh, all of these people are here for the, as long as they are for the day, and find them and ask them questions uh, outside of this moment right now. And uh, I am sure that they will, they will be happy to answer. Yes. This is a question for Dr. Zaki. I'm curious uh, if you've followed up by uh, putting anybody into uh, doing fMRI with people who are trained in doing uh, sympathetic joy meditation and seeing what lights up. That's a great question. Um, we, in my lab, we have not yet looked at sort of expert empathizers or practitioners, um, but Tanya Singer has done a lot of that, and she and I are collaborating now um, in a training program uh, for physicians. So we're, we're interested not in people who are better trained versus people who are not trained, but rather in whether people change uh, at, before uh, versus after such training. A question for um, actually most of the speakers. I'm, I'm interested in if anyone has um, looked specifically at the uh, sensory input pathway dependence of the reward activation systems. So, in other, so we have five canonical sen you know, <laughs> senses, you know, and most of you deal with a combination of inputs via the visual and auditory um, pathways, but you know, we also have tactile and gustatory and olfactory, um, and then we have probably one sixth sense that no one talks about because it's so important that it's subconscious, and, and that is our chemosensory monitoring via autonomic nervous system and, and you know, uh, vagus and, and, and brainstem. And so is there a hierarchy of, of sensory input systems that maximally activates reward and then are there blends of the, system, of, of the five or six sensory inputs that maximally activate reward? I'll ask for, for myself one aspect. So we were actually measuring, I didn't talk about this, but we were measuring psychophysiological changes. So we were measuring um, uh, the changes that were happening to the body, and then we were uh, correlating the neural activity in real time with embodied changes and with feelings. And what we found is that the correlations with embodied changes were statistically separate from the correlations with feelings in the same visceral somatosensory region. So in other words, the, it's as if the region was doing two simultaneous jobs at the same time layered on top of each other. One was feeling the body and the other was having a psychological state. And they were actually completely statistically dissociable. So it seems like what we were studying at least was relatively dissociated from the somatosensory input, from the perception of the body, was instead a kind of cultural, psychological process that's been specialized over time to construct conscious awareness of a complex mental state. Also, I'd like to add that, um, that the model that I presented is based on work 
both the animal work looks at olfactory signals that are being transmitted by the amygdala, that's where mo most of that work comes from, and then the parental responses in human neuroimaging come from um, auditory signals of like hearing baby cries are, is a significant component. And then in our, in, in our experiments, we, we're talking about um, measuring not just sympathetic arousal, but we also look at um, respiratory sinus arrhythmia as well and find big differences between oxytocin's relationship to RSA in one instance versus another. Um, can we grab one last question? We've yeah, one I'll just say um, you can dis disentangle, you can dissociate these signals from sensory input and motor output. That's a very basic answer. By um, cueing the person, then taking away all the sensory input and looking for activation. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not more tightly linked to one more modality than the other. And that's how I took your question. And that's something that people are trying to figure out. This question is for Stephanie Brown. Is any of the work that you've done on oxytocin and progesterone in men? And are there big differences there? Okay, so our work itself is focused on women, um, but most of the, my understanding of the oxytocin work in humans is that it's mostly been done with men. And at least what we know about progesterone um, is that it's produced in the brain of both men and women, and so it, um, there's no reason a priori to assume that males wouldn't also have uh, similar um, processes going on, although estrogen does increase binding of oxytocin receptors in the medial preoptic area. So females may come in with an advantage in some ways. All right, so regrettably, we're out of time for this panel, but again, find these people in the free spaces between. Thank you so much. This was such a joy. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs>